the thing about memory is that one remembers what one wants to remember and one forgets the things that are unimportant and one forgets the things that clutter up the mind and that should be forgotten. But when I now think of my internment, I tend to remember the anecdotes, the funny little stories, the amusing men, the rotten officers who were guarding us and the stupidities of it all. And and one remembers amusing moments and one forgets how awful it all was, how what a waste and how stupid and how depressing and unpleasant it all was. And Therefore, it is very easy to create the wrong impression. If I now tell you a few things about what happened to me after I was put into my first British camp, which I, to which I was taken after I was arrested together with, I think, other 80 students and professors at Cambridge. Uh, the first camp was in Barry St. Edmunds, and the problem there was there was nothing to eat. Uh, when I say nothing to eat, certainly not enough to eat. And for the three months in which we were interned in England, in I think altogether three camps, we were always hungry. Uh, that's, that's, that's the kind of thing one forgets, but it, is, it was a chronic feeling of... N hunger of not being of not having had enough to eat um, the other things that I remember very well very clearly is that we began right away having classes lectures seminars discussion groups there were so many bright people around and the one if we didn't have enough to eat we certainly had enough to learn and learn from very, very bright people. And I remember some of them, and I remember the thing. And, and I also remember, this is a very amus amusing, I shouldn't say that, a very significant um, a, a fact about having a lot of hundreds of people together, is you establish a kind of class system automatically that people congregate with their likes, kindred spirits. They, 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 it comes naturally so that every camp becomes a society with a top class, a middle class, and a lower class. And, and it, is, it is not constructed by anybody, but it is something that happens naturally. For sociologists or people who have a feeling for social relationships, this is a very interesting time. Uh, I also remember, of course, I remember the guards. This was the time after Dunkirk. There are some of the guards who guarded us in the British camps had been rescued at Dunkirk. And, and although they were not supposed to talk to us, they did. And we were cut off from the world because there was no radio allowed. There were no newspapers allowed. And all you had was gossip, rumors. We lived off rumors. And, you, and we all know what it's like when there are rumors, when you are dependent on rumors. The rumors become more and more fanciful. However, <clears throat> excuse me. However, we did learn in June 1940, the darkest, darkest time of the Second World War, that... France had fallen, Paris had fallen, Hitler in Paris. And it, it seemed to be extremely plausible, if not likely, this is easy to forget this, that the Germans would invade England. And if they would invade England, there we were, refugees from England, ready for the plucking, ready made the English had already congregated us 
assembled us for the invading Nazis to gather. Now, this is what had happened in France. In France, in 1939, at the outbreak of the war, refugees like me had been interned right away, which had not happened in England in the same way. And when in, nine, in June the Nazis came, they certainly took over the camps and with lethal consequences for the inhabitants. And, and we didn't know that, of course. But we did talk with great <laughs> a kind of masochistic relish about the changing of the guards. There were the, the, the decrepit English guards, they were not so decrepit as the later the, the Canadian guards, but let's say the English guards who were, who were guarding us at the, the barbed wire, they would be succeeded, there would be a changing of the guards. They would be taken over by the SS. And whatever that meant. Now, of course, it's, all this was long before anybody had heard of extermination camps. However, our imagination was vivid, and I remember one man, a very bright man, interesting man, who had fought in the Spanish Civil War, who kept saying, I'd much prefer to read about this in the New York Times than to have to experience it myself. And this is a line which then had been quoted quite often. Whenever something unpleasant happened, we would say, we'd much rather read about it in the New York Times than, <laughs> than having to endure this ourselves. However, how do I go on? One day in late June, maybe, or early July, there was a decree that young, all those young people, young men, there were no women, because the British never thought that women could be spies. They hadn't read the right books. Anyhow, no women, young men between, where the youngest of us was 16 and 30, who were not married, uh, would be taken out of England to a place that, which could not be disclosed. And we were to assemble at the gate with our whatever we had, which was practically nothing, uh, little suitcases. Then we were taken to Liverpool, and then we were marched through the streets in Liverpool to the port. Heavily guarded, of course, because we looked like civilian prisoners, which we were. And... I have I can't swear to this, but it was said that there were people lining up the streets who were spitting at us, spitting at us, because they thought we were captured Nazis. I don't, I, uh, it's a long time ago, I don't think anybody spat at me, but I, probably not true, but anyhow, this is what we So we then arrived at the, at the harbour in Liverpool, and we were then put in a ship, and I think I will skip this, because the ship was so terrible, it was so terrible, it was so overcrowded and so dangerous. Another ship, there were three ships, another ship was torpedoed and did go down with serious loss of life. Uh, we heard about this when we were... It was torpedoed off the coast of Ireland. And uh, uh, I don't really want it. It's so awful. Uh, we all got sick, dysentery, and and huge overcrowding. We could never go, go on deck. It was a horror trip. And I think, well, really, I, I have conveniently forgotten how horrible it was because one prefers to remember the pleasant things and not the terror, terror thing. So soon I later, so we arrived after I think thirteen days or so in a convoy. We arrived in Quebec, and that our reception, our first encounter with the Canadian authorities, is the subject of another of these important discourses. <laughs>